244. Number 19. You know, when you, when I sit down to actually write out the message that God has been dealing with me about all week and stuff, you know, you think, oh, this is going to be quick. I'm going to have to fill in some time. And then you get done writing and you're like, uh, I better trim this up. <laughs> I'll be there all night. <laughs> right? Which, uh, hey, I mean, when Ezra the scribe had all the people standing, he stood on a pulpit of wood, and all the people stood, and they read the entire law. <laughs> uh, we could do that. <laughs> um, we might be here all day, but we're not going to. Luke chapter number 19. And uh, we're going to be bounce around between the Gospels here. And this is uh, known as Palm Sunday. And uh, next week's Resurrection Sunday. And so most... Churches, most pastors and people around the world are probably teaching on something like this, preaching on this subject of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus Christ. I'm going to cover that uh, very lightly, or we're going to read it, but there's a particular phrase in that story that God just struck me with all week and really burdened my heart about, about some things. Luke chapter number 19 Verse number 28. It says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. 
And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering in ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat, loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of them. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even, unto, even now unto the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. You know, you should be praising God for all the things that you've seen Him do in your life. Amen. Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees and religious people from among the multitude said unto them, uh, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Uh, we're more pious than that. We wouldn't take that. And he answered and said unto him, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. God created you to praise Him. He created everything to praise Him. The Bible says a whole creation groaneth and travaileth. Uh, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this day, the things which belong unto thee peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay, even, lay thee even with the ground. And thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, work in this message. Lord, the thoughts would, would come through that you desire, Lord, and the, the words out of my mouth would be be uh, pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that you hide me behind the cross. Lord, you cleanse me of myself and my sin. Lord, as a uh, attempt to deliver this message that you gave me. Lord, we do love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said, today is generally regarded as Palm Sunday. Next week being Resurrection Sunday. Uh, this next Sunday, after the donkey and the palm leaves, uh, is that resurrection and the appearances of the risen Christ to the disciples later, assuring them that their king was conquered has conquered, that death has lost its dominion, and we've been given new life. Uh, if Christ had not risen from the dead, we are, of all, as Paul says, we are of all men most miserable. There's nothing different than any other religion. Uh, like I said, for much of the past week, I kind of struggled with what to preach in regard to this narrative laid out before us here in Luke. Um, I thought about the significance of the journey going into Jerusalem. I've thought about the importance of the donkey that Christ rode and how the donkey's sole purpose is to lift Jesus up and not be glorified in himself. His entire purpose was to lift Jesus up and allow Jesus to lead him. I've even preached a message in the past on be a donkey for Jesus, uh, using that passage. And uh, there's some very significant things about the donkey. There's a cross on the back of the donkey. Um, if you've never seen a picture, you never, it, there's just so many similarities. I'm like, God, I've done this before. I'm confident. Uh, let me, he said, no, I couldn't be settled on that. Uh, I could, I thought about the crowd and all the different reactions from the crowd. There's the religious crowd. There's the disciples that went and obeyed. And there's the people there that thought that Hosanna meaning save, save us. They were calling for the wrong king. They thought Jesus was coming to establish his earthly kingdom. And he says, I'm not here for an earthly kingdom. You notice he rode in on a donkey. One of the other significances of the donkey, when, he, when a king rides into a town on a donkey, he's a bringer of peace. Uh, normally, when they would come in uh, on a horse, it meant they were there to conquer. So that led me to comparing Luke chapter 19 to Revelation chapter 19 and how Jesus is compared there with Jesus riding into Jerusalem with no crown on his head, uh, clothes laid out in the mud in front of him and on the donkey before him. He's riding in on a mule bringing peace, but in Revelation 19 he's coming back with a sharp sword, uh, a king of kings on a white horse ready to execute judgment and justice. 
Because true peace requires some justice. You can't have mercy and grace without justice and law. There ha there's uh, so much there that goes on. I thought of uh, verse 34. It says, The Lord hath need of him. I thought about, well, what does the Lord need from us? And what, is, what does he need from his people? You know what? He wants people just to be committed to him, to serve him, to love him, to proclaim his name. And he just wants to talk with you, folks. I thought about um, many of these other things uh, in regards to this. You think about the crowd crying, Hosanna, uh, and just a few chapters later, they're saying, kill him. They're saying, crucify him. Shows the, the fickleness of the world that just goes to whatever's the most popular at the time. And if you follow the crowd, you're going to end up in the wrong spot. Yeah. Right? That's why wide is okay. Uh, and broad is the way that, that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Narrow is the gate. There are so many different things that I was like, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> I think this would be all right. But then I began to think of the mercy of God poured out to sinners everywhere. I began to think about as he was riding that, that donkey into the city, if you look at verse number 41, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. My thought today is, does Jesus weep for thee? Does Jesus weep for thee? There are three times in the Bible where Jesus weeps. And we're going to kind of go through those. But I was thinking on this particular day, the week before he's about to rise from the dead, and the week that he's getting, getting crucified, as he's walking into the city, or riding into the city on something that he created, uh, I'm pretty sure that donkey probably knew what was going on. God created him. And here, the Son of God is sitting on this donkey, walking in, looking at this city and say, oh, what, I, what I've done for thee. And just beginning to weep over as he views the city. When we first moved to Lewiston, Idaho, way up above Lewiston, Idaho, uh, so Lewiston, Idaho sits about 700 feet uh, above sea level. It's the lowest point in Idaho, but the highway up there is about 2,000 feet above sea level. And you can uh, pull off and look down in the entire valley and you see these, these multiple cities. And I remember when we first moved there, I knew that God called us there. We stopped there on the top of that hill and we said, God, we don't know what we're doing here, but we're, we're asking for your direction. And we prayed over the souls of that city and we were able to, with, with Brother Gimp and, and with the Lord's help, we were able to see a church grow from uh, 15 people that I think they got 80 or 90 now. How does that happen? Because God's there. God was allowed to work in some places. But here Jesus says he's approaching Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits way up high. And as he's approaching that, he's seeing that. Mm. What, I what I've done for you. If you only knew. He says in verse number, uh, verse number 42, saying, If thou hadst known, even now, at least in this thy day, if you only knew what I was doing right now for you. The carelessness, apathy, sounds like America today. Yeah. Sounds like our world today. This thought of Jesus weeping just permeated my mind. I couldn't sleep and just weeping. God wept for me. In the midst of all the fanfare and the multitudes crying out Hosanna looking for this earthly king, our great Savior saw that city of Jerusalem, the people around him, and he began to weep. Go to John eleven thirty five, 35, shortest verse in the Bible. John chapter number 11. My, like I said, my question for you today is, does Jesus weep through, the, through thee, for thee? John chapter 11, we know that Lazarus dies. And Lazarus is in the tomb. And John chapter 11, in verse number 32, it says, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother hadn't died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, like, oh man, and was troubled, 
and said, where have you laid him? And they said, him, Lord, come and see. He says, Jesus wept. While, yes, his friend died, you look back in verse 15, it was for a purpose. Jesus let Lazarus die so that his, he could be glorified and so that people could see him. In verse number 15, it says, or verse number 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And you'll look down in verse number 25, or verse number um, uh, 23, Jesus saith unto her, talking to Martha, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, which uh, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And Jesus weeping over faithlessness. There's people, he, he was weeping over the lack of faith that these people had in his abilities to raise Lazarus from the dead. Or in his... He, of who he was. All through the Gospel of John and through many other areas, we see Jesus performing all these different miracles and showing all this work and all the, uh, the prophecies that point to Jesus Christ. And his friend is dead and people, as they go to show him the grave where Lazarus is, Jesus begins to weep with a lack of faith. Every day, we see God working in our life. We see Him working around us, yet we still fail to place our complete faith and trust in Him. To provide, as I was sitting there at the building, just crying out, wondering about this, wondering about that. And, well, how is this going to happen? Oh, what about this inspection? And while I'm waiting for the building inspector to show up, I'm walking around, I'm praying, I'm trying to talk to God. Uh, just blabbering my mouth off in, in the building there, no one around, just saying, God, I, I don't know why I'm nervous about that. I know we've done everything we can. Um, I, I know we've gotten to a point, God, I, I'm sorry for my lack of faith. But, and then I just start singing, I bust out one of those hymn books and start singing as I'm walking around the building. And what a sweet time of fellowship it was with the Lord. The Lord reminded me, look, I've brought you this far. Just let me, let me handle it. There's a sign in our house that says, the grace of God will not keep you, or the will of God will not take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. It takes the faith. Matthew 6.30 says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Where's our faith? You know why churches are empty? Because people lost their faith. Yeah. People have left their faith. They quit trusting God to take care of things. Why, are so, why is uh, anxiety and depression and alcoholism and suicide the highest it's ever been in our nation? People got away from God. People got away from trusting God to take care of money. I'm not worried about food unless it comes from certain people. I'm not going to tell you who. Because I'm going to keep you all under, <laughs> under suspicion. No. I'm not worried about my next meal. I'm not worried about a whole lot of other things. Where I know there's people out there who are, who are thinking about things this week and, and stressing about all kind of stuff. And yes, I get to that point too, but we have to step back and remember, hey God, I placed my faith in you to save me from my, save my sin. I place my faith in you to redeem me from eternity and hell. Why can't I place my faith in you on a daily basis just to take care of my needs? You said you would. Even his disciples who saw him every day and experienced some of the things with him lacked faith. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, he saith to them, Why are ye fearful, O ye a little faith? When they're in the boat, then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. We can sometimes, as I mentioned, the prayer with the gasoline thing, often our, our faith is like that. We get so used to just things happening, we forget who makes them happen. Folks, is Jesus weeping over your lack of faith, saying, you know what, I would, 
I just wish you'd have more faith in me. I just wish you could trust me. Kind of like when we tell our kids, oh, this, this, this is good for you. Go do this. You're going to do all right because you know they will. And then they, look, they doubt everything that you just said. We are like that. We know God's going to take care of us. I can, I can assure you, everybody here can say, yeah, I know God loves me. I know he's going to take care of me. I know he's got a plan for me. So why don't we just leave it to him? It's just allowing God to work with us. Secondly, we look at back in Luke chapter number 19. While you're turning to Luke 19, uh, Jesus weeping over faithlessness. Three little boys gave their definition of faith. One said, faith is taking hold of God. The second said, faith is holding on to God. The third said, faith is not letting go. All three are right. Faith is taking hold of God at His Word, holding on to Him, and not letting go. Luke 19.41 And when He was come near, He beheld the city and wept over it. And kind of mentioned this earlier, but Jesus wept over their carelessness. When He weeps over faithlessness, then He weeps over carelessness. As Christ was riding into view of this city, I can picture him weeping over the apathy and just the carelessness of everything that he's done for him. Have you forget how much God's done for you? Have you become careless in your Christian walk? You know what, as a nation, we've become very careless. We've become very apathetic to anything of God. Our churches are falling apart and closing every day. 300 Baptist churches close every single year. Why? People quit caring. Yeah. People just quit caring. You know, I've been doing this all of my life. I can miss here and I can miss there. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't. You know what the devil likes to do? He can't take your soul, but he can lull you into a deep sleep of where you're of no, no heavenly good down here. You're of no good. Or you can't have become careless. The, ter the tears of Jesus, you think of the lost privileges in that, that next verse. Thou hadst known the things, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Jerusalem had some privileges they could have taken advantage of. Imagine, we all think about there, imagine what it would be like to sit at a table or walk the road, the road to Emmaus with Jesus. And our mind looking back, we're saying, oh, that would be just awesome. But in reality, our flesh might take over and we might be like the two guys on the road to Emmaus who have no clue that that's it. Oh, there's also lost opportunities. Jesus is weeping over him. I gave you an opportunity to do something. You didn't do it. But I think really it's over the lost souls. Folks, when's the last time you wept over a lost soul? When's the last time you thought about somebody on this island that you can reach and you poured out before God to them? Said, so God, make me tender to them. Out there on the bulletin board, the last couple of weeks, I've put a missionary letter and a country fact. And uh, last week, I think I had Finland up there, or Estonia up there, and 68% uh, of that country is atheist. Say, so how? Then I put one up today, Papua New Guinea, 9 million people, very heavily evangelized. Well, as it's getting there, only 13% of that people live in urban centers, and there's people all over those hills. Alan can tell you, many people can tell you. There's people all over that country that are just needing to hear the gospel. The work of Christ at Jerusalem should have been enough to turn that city, but their hardness of heart and their careless attitude created that apathetic attitude that allowed them to say, crucify him only a few verses and chapters later. In Jerusalem, Christ healed a lame man by the pool of Bethsaida in John chapter 5, and in Luke chapter 6, he healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day, challenging the religious traditions of those cities. Jesus did some mighty works in Jerusalem. 
And it's like, oh, that's cool. And I'm sure there are many more. John chapter 20 and verse uh, 30 and 31 says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. We don't know how many miracles Jesus really did. Mm -hmm. But these are here for us to believe and to have faith. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. What about your reject their rejection? As he's riding up to the city, you think about he's thinking about the people that are going to reject him. He says, I've called unto you and you haven't answered. I'm giving you an opportunity, and he knows that when he goes and he faces this cross, this cruel cross, he knows there are people that are going to still scoff at it and say, I don't want it. Let me ask you a few questions here. Does, does Jesus weep over your carelessness of his mighty works? We get so used to God taking care of us with this building, I pray that it does not become a habit. To us to just say, oh, yeah, God, yeah, take care of it. I don't need to pray about it. Does he weep over your apathy to the things of God? Does God have priority in your life? How come Bible reading isn't important to you when he wrote it? How come witnessing to other people isn't important to you? Is Jesus weeping over the fact that you've never told somebody else about him? Are pe people are going to hell. Is that not enough for some of us to try to witness to somebody or live for the Lord? What's it gonna, what does it take? Well, you, you think God is, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem and as he's looking, looking at us, he says, what is it going to take for this church to get serious about me? What is it going to take for each of us to get serious about God? You know what it took for me? It took me losing a daughter uh, for me to get serious with God. And then it, my thoughts, and, and as I think of Jesus weeping, he's just crying out like, I've done all this. I sacrificed for you. I died. I gave you a new life. Do you even care? It's like, it's like if I was to give my son a brand new car and then watch him to go thrash it. Does he really even care? I mean, he probably would because he's a teenager, but. <laughs> what miracle would Jesus have to do for you to get excited about him? Hmm. Why can't you say amen? Why can't you sing the song? Why can't you pray and say, yeah, uh, I'm going to praise the Lord for this. Why can't we just be faithful to church? Why can't we just be faithful to the things that God God is weeping over the apathy of the Laodicean church as we, as we sit there and we just we think we're rich. We're, we think we got everything. God says, you don't have any of that. My friend, I plead with you, let's get serious with God. Let's get serious and help rescue a soul from hell. And go back to, uh, look, go over a couple chapters of Luke chapter 22 to the final point here. It's only 9 o'clock. i got plenty of time. <laughs> Luke chapter 22 and verse number 39 through verse number 46. Jesus is now in the Garden of Gethsemane. I challenge you to go home and Read these passages and just let them soak in. And think about, don't just read the words. Ask the Lord to speak to you and, and work to you. In Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 39, it says, and he, went, and, and he came out and went as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, Thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What do you think he saw as he's looking at Jerusalem, as he's riding on the back of that donkey into Jerusalem? You know what he's seeing? He's seeing that cup that's presented right in front of him here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Next verse says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. You ever get down and pray sometimes just in agony and just pouring your heart out to God? And when you get done, and there's a certain point in your prayer life where you're praying, 
you just feel renewed and re regenerated. And I remember uh, when we first moved to Idaho, I didn't have a job. We didn't have a house. We didn't have anything. We lived with her grandparents, and I'm praying about a job. I said, God, you moved me out here. And I said, God, I'm going to fast. Fasted for three days. It was what I set out to do was to fast for three days. And, you know, I can go a full day without eating, no problem. But when I know I'm not supposed to, I'm hungry five seconds after I commit to doing what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I could devour four large pizzas. But I, any time I'd get hunger pains, I'd go and pray. Pray throughout the day. Or in, in, at lunch, breakfast, and dinner, and all this, I'd go pray while, while people were eating. Not because I'm anybody spiritual. Folks, I was searching for God's help. And I remember about the second day, about halfway through the second day, I'm just pouring my heart out to God, saying, God, I'm really hungry. Can you answer my prayer? <laughs> no, but I was like, God, I, I really need you to help me. And all of a sudden, I just started bursting out in tears. I didn't know how that came over me. I was just praying, thanking God for stuff, and saying, God, I need a job, and all this. And then all of a sudden, I just started bursting out in tears. And about five minutes later, I get up from praying. I felt like a new man. The Lord strengthened me. And David encouraged himself in the Lord. You know what? The Lord here in the garden, he's got nobody else around him because all his disciples would flee and leave him. He needed some strength. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And Jesus wept over the hopeless. Here, you know what he did? He wept over you and me. He wept over the faithless. He wept over the careless. But I'm thankful he wept over the hopeless. I had no hope. Until Jesus showed up. The last thing Jesus wept over was me. Me, the sinner who put him, my sins put him on that cross. Me, a person headed to an eternity in hell. And God wept over and said, I want to rescue that soul. I want a relationship. Why? Why would he weep over me? Because he loved me. Why does he weep? Because he loves. He wants to see. Why would he get on this donkey knowing where he's going, knowing what's ahead of him? Because of love. You know, God, the greatest gospel verse ever is John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. So loved. He entered Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday because he was being totally obedient to the voice of his Father. And think about this. In verse number 42 it says, uh, Father, if, I, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He will say, well, Jesus knew he was doing. Isn't that, that like suicidal mission type of thing? No. When a soldier jumps on a grenade for his buddies, that's not suicide. That's heroism. You know what Jesus did? He took my sins. He says, I'm taking His place. I'm going to hang on that cross. I'm going to get spit on. I'm going to get beat on. I'm going to get cursed on. I'm going to get a, a sword and a spear in the side of me. I'm going to take those nails through the hands and through the feet. I'm going to take that crown of thorns. I'm going to take all that because I love you. Because it is on my sin to put Him there. Jesus entered Jerusalem that day because of the love to His Father and because of His love to humanity. He was not looking forward to die. Looking to die, He was looking for death. And when He found death, He defeated it. And He rose from the grave victorious. As the song says, we'll probably sing next week. Out from the grave He arose. Right? On the back of a donkey on the road to Jerusalem, Christ saw what the next week would hold. What the next few days would hold, he saw the cup of torment and suffering from the Garden of Gethsemane. He saw that cup. He saw what he would have to go through. He would see that separation from God the Father. But folks, though he saw all the torment and though he saw all of this, I was thinking about this the other day, as, as Jesus had been scourged, and which Pilate didn't have to do, he scourged him, he put the, those... His cat of nine tails in his back and ripped that flesh wide open and then put him on a, a wooden cross. And you think about, I'm pretty sure they didn't sand that thing down before they put him up there. That's what my God did for me. That's what my Jesus did for me because he loves me. 
And He loves you, folks. He died for you. He paid your sin debt. He said, He said, I don't care who you are or what you've done or what your past looks like. It's clean. That old account is being settled here on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. And I'm, I'm. He said, All you got to do is accept it. He said, All you got to do is take it as He suffered there for me, as He wept over the city of Jerusalem, as He wept over the people, as He wept over those that are hopeless. You know, and I'm so glad that my Jesus weeps for me. In that sense of like, he saw I was hopeless. He saw I was helpless. I'm going to take over for him. He saw victory. There's victory in Jesus. Faith is the victory. He saw what dying for me would mean. He said, I can conquer death. Charles can't. I am going to take his place. He's going to come live with me one day. Amen. I'm not going to have to worry about knee pain. I'm not going to have to worry about headaches. I'm not going to have to worry about, well, should I eat that kind of fat or not kind of fat? Or should I do? I ain't got to worry about that. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Amen. Amen. He saw a redeemed Charles. He saw a hopeless soul. And he was willing to go through all of that for me. But folks, not just for me, for you. He did that for you. And Jesus wept over the faithless. How's your faith? He wept over the careless. Have you become careless towards the things of God? Most importantly, He wept over me, the hopeless. What category are you in? Maybe you are saved. I pray that everyone here is. But are, how careless are you to the things of God? How faithful are you to God? But my friend, if you're in the last category of hopelessness, there is hope and peace to be found in place in your faith in Jesus Christ. Calling upon Him, repenting of your sins, and saying, God, be merciful to be a sinner. Amen. Yes. Never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says today is the day yes. of salvation. Yes. Yes. We don't know how much time we have. We don't know. I could I could have a heart attack right now. I've known I've known a preacher that had a heart attack in the pulpit and back in the middle of the sermon. You know what? He died doing what he loved. You know what? We don't know how much time we have. Why don't we get folks where God wants us when he comes back? Yeah. Very simple. Romans 10, 13 is one of my favorite Bible verses. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It said whosoever. It's open to anybody. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his grace, by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. God commendeth his love toward us. He said, Chuck, I love you. I'm going to die for you. He said, Lauren, I don't care what you've done. I've paid it. We've been bought with a price, folks. Let's glorify God in our bodies. Let's all stand. Yes, Steve, come up here and just play like two verses softly and tenderly or something. We'll just bow our head. I don't typically do an invitation and we don't really have anywhere to come up here. I just want you to take a moment, bow your head, close your eyes. Think about what God did for you. And think about Jesus weeping over you. Where can we change as a people, as a church? If there's somebody here who's never trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, I beg you, please. He wept for you. He wept for the hopeless. Your sins are forgiven. You place your faith in Him. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not only that, it says much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Does 
Jesus weep for thee? If you've got questions or anything, there's people here that can answer them. We, you can grab me afterwards or whatever. I just want to make sure the Bible tells me woe was unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's what I've tried to do today. Our dear and my Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for getting on the back of that donkey, heading into Jerusalem, and knowing what you were facing. Lord, thank you for your weeping and willingness to take that cup of my sin and save me. Lord, I fail you often. Lord, and I do ask forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a church that's not careless, to be a church that does have faith towards you and in you and what you're going to do. And Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us when we don't. Forgive us for our apathy. Lord, forgive us for our just lackadaisical attitude to the things of God. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for weeping over the hopeless. We do love you, Lord. I ask that you bless us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.